Mali was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and he were partners for years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. It stood above the door, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people called Scrooge Marley. He answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was tight-fisted with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Nobody ever stopped him to say, My dear Scrooge, how are you? No beggars implored him. No man ever inquired the way of Scrooge. But what did Scrooge care? Christmas Eve. Old Scrooge, busy in his counting house. Cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather. Only just gone three, but quite dark already. In a dismal little cell, a sort of tank, his clerk was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerks looked like one coal. Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of a strong imagination, he failed. <laughs> a Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! It was Scrooge's nephew. Bah! Humbug! Well, Christmas a humbug, Uncle. <laughs> you don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time but a time for paying bills without money, for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> Nephew, you keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. I've always thought of Christmas as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time when men and women seem to open their hearts freely and though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. I will see you in hell first. But why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. But you never came to see me before that happened. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute, but I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. <laughs> Two portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, stood in Scrooge's office. They bowed. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr Scrooge or Mr Marley? Mr Marley died seven years ago this very night. At this um, festive season of the year, Mr Scrooge, it is desirable that we should make some provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Are there no prisons? <laughs> yeah, plenty, but they scarcely furnish Christian cheer. A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. I don't make merry at Christmas. And I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough. And those who are badly off must go there. Well, many can't go there. And, and many would rather die. If they'd rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge admitted the fact to the clerk. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. Well, if quite convenient, sir. It's not, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. And yet, you don't think me ill-used 
when I pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir. Yeah, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern and went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner, a gloomy suite of rooms in a building nobody lived in but Scrooge, the other rooms being offices. There was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house except that it was very large. Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence at that place, and yet Scrooge, his key in the lock, saw in the knocker Marley's face. Marley's face, with a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. <laughs> As Scrooge looked fixedly at it, it was a knocker again. He said, pow, pow, and closed the door with a bang, which resounded through the house like thunder. Every room appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He walked across the hall and up the stairs, not caring a button for its being very dark. Darkness is cheap. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Nobody under the table. Nobody under the sofa. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. <laughs> He closed his door and double-locked himself in. He put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the very low fire. His glance happened to rest upon a disused bell that hung in the room. With a strange, inexplicable dread, he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, then much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It came on through the heavy door and a spectre passed into the room before his eyes. The dying flame leaped up as though it cried, Marley's ghost. His body was transparent. How now? What do you want with me? March. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. The ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace. You don't believe in me? I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef. <laughs> Fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes. He tried to be smart as a means of keeping down his horror. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Mercy! Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot linger anywhere. In life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. O oh, blind man, blind man, not to know that ages of incessant labour by immortal creatures must pass into eternity before the good is all developed, that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness, that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities missed. Yet I was once 
like this man. You were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, tolerance were all my business. At this time of year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down? Scrooge began to wake exceedingly. Don't be hard upon me, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. The second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Remember what has passed between us. It walked backward from him. The window raised itself and it floated out into the bleak, dark night. Scrooge closed the window. He examined the door. It was double locked. The bolts were undisturbed. Humbug! He went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep on the instant. Scrooge awoke. It was dark. Suddenly, the church clock tolled a deep, dark, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room. The curtains of his bed were drawn by a strange figure, like a child, yet like an old man. Its hair was white, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. From the crown of its head sprang a bright, clear jet of light. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. Rise and walk with me. It would have been vain for Scrooge to plead that the thermometer was a long way below freezing, that he was in slippers, dressing gown and nightcap. The grasp, though gentle, was not to be resisted. The spirit made towards the window. Ah, I'm, I'm liable to fall! Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld. They passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a warehouse and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Knew it? I was apprenticed here. They went in. Why, it's old Fezziwig, bless his heart. It's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself. Yo there! Ebenezer! Dick! A living picture of Scrooge's former self, a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, my old fellow apprentice. He, he was very much attached to me. Poor Dick. Yo ho, my boys! No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Clear away, my lads. Let's have lots of room here. Every movable was packed off. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire. And the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler. In came Mrs. Fezziwig. One vast smile. The three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. The six young followers whose hearts they broke. All the young men and women employed in the business, in they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couples at once, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping, until old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! There were more dances and forfeits and more dances and cake and a great piece of cold roast and a great piece of cold boiled and mince pies and plenty of beer. The fiddler struck up, Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. 
when the clock struck eleven, Mr and Mrs Fezziwig, shaking hands with every person individually, wished him or her a Merry Christmas, and thus the cheerful voices died away. A small matter, said the ghost. He has spent but a few pounds. Well, it isn't that. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service a pleasure or a toil. His power lies in words and looks. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. My time grows short. Quick. Again he saw himself, older now, a man in the prime of life, sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress. It matters little, she said. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you, I have no just cause to grieve. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Well, what then? <laughs> Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you? Have I ever sought release from our engagement? No, in words, no. But in a changed nature, in an altered spirit, I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you, these were shadows of the things that have been. Do not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me, take me back. Haunt me no longer. He was exhausted, and in his own bedroom, he sank into a heavy sleep. Scrooge awoke. His bedroom had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were hung with living green. The leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light. An almighty blaze went roaring up the chimney. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, game, great joints of meat, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, Cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense cakes, and great bowls of punch. Upon this couch sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape like Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Spirit. Last night I learnt a lesson. Tonight, teach me. Let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Instantly. They were in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Straight to, to Scrooge's clerks. The spirit smiled and blessed Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Mrs Cratchit, in a twice-turned gown but brave in ribbons, which make a goodly show for sixpence, laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes. Two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they'd smelt the goose and known it for their own and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion. These young Cratchits danced about the table. What has ever got your precious father then, said Mrs Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha? Here's Martha, mother! There's such a goose, Martha! Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. Mrs Cratchit kissed her a dozen times. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless you. No, no, there's father coming. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter, exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. What? Where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, 
so she came out prematurely and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? As good as gold and better. Back came Tiny Tim, escorted by his brother and sister. Bob compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs Cratchit made the gravy hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody and crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. <laughs> at last, grace was said. A breathless pause as Mrs Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of <laughs> universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. The youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. <laughs> but now, Mrs Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it. Hello? A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs Cratchit since their marriage. <laughs> Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. Apples and oranges were put on the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth at Bob Cratchit's elbow. Stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side, upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Mr Scrooge, I'll give you Mr Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon and hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care tuppence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, 
They were ten times merrier than before from mere relief. The chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and they had a song from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little, little voice and sang it very well indeed. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from waterproof. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as this scene vanished, to hear a hearty laugh, to recognise it as his nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, the spirit smiling by his side. There is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humour. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends laughed out lustily. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. He believed it too. <laughs> More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. She was exceedingly pretty. He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as, as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He loses a very good dinner. Everybody said the same. They'd just had dinner and with the dessert upon the table, were clustered round the fire by lamplight. They had music. They were a musical family. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas. There was Blind Man's Buff, and there was a game called Yes and No. Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what, he only answering yes or no. He was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, <laughs> a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes and lived in London and <laughs> walked around the streets and didn't live in a menagerie and was not a horse or an ass or a cow or a bull or a tiger or a dog or a pig or a cat or a bear. At every new question, he burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, his sister-in-law cried out, I know what it is, Fred! It's your Uncle Scrooge! <laughs> it was, though some objected that the reply to Is it a bear? ought to have been yes. <laughs> Scrooge and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. In almshouse, hospital and jail, in misery's every refuge where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Scrooge bent down upon one knee. The spirit seemed to scatter gloom and misery. A deep black garment left nothing visible save one outstretched hand. The spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But I know you purpose to do me good. Will you not speak to me? The hand pointed straight before them. Lead on, spirit. The city seemed to spring up about them. They were in the heart of it. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. The hand pointed. Scrooge advanced to listen. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When? Well, last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. What's he done with his money? <laughs> What's he done with his money? Hey, he hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye-bye. <laughs> Scrooge looked about. Another man stood in his accustomed corner. He saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes. They went to a low shop where a grey-haired rascal sat smoking. A woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. What you got to sell? What you got to sell? What odds then? What odds? 
Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worst for a loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. If he wanted to keep them after he was dead, why well, wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had someone to look after him instead of lying gasping out his last there, all alone by himself. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. What you call this? Bed curtains? Ah, bed curtains. His blankets? Whose else's, do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. Oh, that shirt's the best he had. He'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it, if it hadn't been for me. Spirit. <laughs> I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. Merciful heavens, what is this? A bare, uncurtained bed. On it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, the body of this plundered man unknown. Spirit. Let me see some tenderness connected with a death, or, or this dark chamber spirit will, will be forever present to me. Bob Cratchit's house. Mother and children seated round the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits still as statues, looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters engaged in needlework. But surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and sat him in the midst of them, the boy read. But the mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The colour hurts my eyes. We're better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight. And I, I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home. It must be near his time. I think he's walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. I've known him walk with... I've known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. But he was very light to carry and his father loved him so that there was no trouble, no trouble. Oh, and there is your father at the door. Little Bob and his comforter came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knee and laid each child a little cheek against his face as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. Spectre. What man was that whom we saw lying dead? The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard and pointed to a grave. Are these things that will be, or things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed. Scrooge read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. No! Spirit! No! Oh no, no! Spirit, hear me! I'm not the man I was. Why show me this if I'm past all hope? Assure me that I, I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will honour Christmas in my heart and, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I, I, I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. The phantom shrank, collapsed and dwindled into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. The churches rang out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night, clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? to a boy in Sunday clothes. Hey, 
What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why? Christmas Day! It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello? Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I said, oh, I did. An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. <laughs> it's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Get out of it. No, 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 I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with a man, and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. It's the size of Tiny Tim. Such a joke it will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him off short in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. He dressed himself all in his best, and got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth. Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he'd ever heard, those were the blithest to his ears. He passed the door of his nephew's house a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. He knows me. I'll go in here, my dear. <laughs> Fred? Why, bless my soul, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he was trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello? What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I, I, I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. Oh, it's only once a year, sir. I shall not be, it shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, tell you what, my friend, I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge leapt from his stool and gave Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. A Merry Christmas, Bob, Scrooge clapped him on the back. A Merry Christmas, Bob, a Merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I've given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.